In the first segment of this lecture, we discussed physiological changes that occur to a variety of tissues as a result of natural aging. Okay, great. So what does this mean for our aging population? I mean, what are the big medical concerns from a musculoskeletal perspective? And along those lines, how can we address these issues in medical practice? In this second session, we'll identify the principal musculoskeletal concerns facing the elderly population, as well as discuss how preventative medicine and early patient education can improve musculoskeletal health in later decades. Frailty is a colorful word that traditionally brings to mind images of weakness and fragility. Or, if you're a Shakespeare fan, an incredibly sexist line from Hamlet. I'll let you look that one up for yourself if you want to, if you're not familiar with it. No way I'm repeating it here. But in medicine, frailty syndrome is actually an identified medical diagnosis. The diagnosis itself is multifactorial and a bit subjective. It's not like shingles where you have it or you don't. Physicians will look at five separate factors in making a diagnosis. First, an inexplicable loss of more than 10 pounds of weight in a calendar year. Second is grip strength. There are age-related standards for grip strength, and falling within the bottom quintile is a qualifying factor for fragility. Similarly, falling into the lowest quintile for walking speed is another qualifying factor for fragility syndrome. The last two qualifying factors are based on standardized questionnaires. This automatically brings a degree of subjectivity into their accession, but both have been extensively researched and are specific for the factors they measure. First is the chronic exhaustion and depression questionnaire. Now, I mean, let's face it, three quarters of us easily, including myself, can describe ourselves as being exhausted right now. But this is a specific questionnaire that identifies exhaustion for reasons other than normal physical exertion. Second is the Minnesota Leisure Time Activity Questionnaire. Again, why Minnesota? Well, they took the time to develop the questionnaire and decided to name it after themselves. So to the victors go the spoils. These subjective tools may change over time as new diagnostic criteria develops, but these are the best diagnostic tools we have available right now. If an individual is positive for any three of the above five qualifying factors, it is considered a positive diagnosis for frailty syndrome. Okay, so now we have a patient that has been diagnosed with frailty syndrome. So what does that mean? Well, it's an important diagnostic tool to identify individuals who are at a greater risk of mortality compared to age-related peers without frailty diagnosis. The largest proportion of frailty syndrome patients are, not surprisingly, over 75 years of age. Primary care physicians should be highly sensitive to female patient populations, which are at a greater risk of frailty compared to age-matched male population. We also see that race and socioeconomic status influence the likelihood of a diagnosis, with black populations and individuals living below the poverty line at greater risk of developing frailty. Okay, there's a well-established link between frailty syndrome and increased morbidity and mortality, but generally speaking, people don't die of frailty. What the diagnosis does do is identifies individuals at a greater risk of developing other medical complications linked to morbidity and mortality. From the musculoskeletal perspective, which is what we're discussing here, probably the most important complication related to frailty is falls. If you think back to when you were a kid, not a day would go by when you did experience a series of falls while running around and playing and you'd pick yourself up wipe off the dust and keep going. This changes as you get older. I mean, I'm in my 40s right now, and although I'm not that old, I'm already noticing that I don't bounce back nearly as much as when I was a kid. For an elderly population, falls are a huge concern. Risk of injury from falls increases with increasing age, and elderly individuals who experience a fall are at a higher risk of mortality compared to aged match peers who have not experienced a fall. In addition, the rate of falls increases for every decade of life past the seventh. A number of precipitating factors contribute to this increased susceptibility to falls. 
Now, we all have moments through the day when we're knocked off balance a little bit and need to make adjustments. For an elderly population, the age-related loss in lower body strength means it's more difficult to correct themselves during these moments and recover stability. A number of factors also directly impact our balance and proprioception. Neurological deficits that can occur over time, particularly involving the cerebellum, can have a negative impact on our sense of balance. Certain medications can do the same thing. Aside from these proprioceptive losses, other sensory deficits, such as hearing and sight loss or the progression of dementia, impact our awareness of our surroundings, leaving us more susceptible to tripping hazards. To further complicate the situation, previous falls can limit a person's mobility, resulting in further losses in strength and an even greater susceptibility to future falls. The concern with falls involves the fractures which accompany them. Of particular concern are hip fractures, which become more common with each decade of life past the seventh. Upper body fractures, such as wrist fractures, for example, are less concerning because they have less of an impact on a patient's quality of life and ability to care for themselves. Even with an ankle or foot fracture, the patient should still be able to ambulate with some assistance. With a hip fracture, on the other hand, the patient is usually bedridden for a period of time due to an inability to transition to a sitting or a standing position. The loss in physical activity, as well as the psychological impact of the diminished quality of life, are factors that contribute to an increased mortality rate for this patient population. And it also highlights the importance of identifying elderly individuals with frailty syndrome. Individuals who have suffered previous fractures related to frailty are at an increased risk for suffering a hip fracture when compared to the general population of similarly aged individuals. Specific attention should also be given to patients in long-term care facilities such as inpatient wards and nursing homes, where the incidence of hip fracture and complications during the recovery from hip fractures is also higher compared to an age-matched cohort living independently. Advances in orthopedic surgeries can improve patient outcomes and mortality rates following hip fracture, but obviously avoiding fracture in the first place would be preferred. And this is where preventative medicine comes into play. If we can identify patients with frailty syndrome, or better still, reach out to individuals years before they may possibly develop frailty syndrome with education and lifestyle modifications, we may decrease the incidence of frailty syndrome and comorbidities, adding quality of life and life expectancy beyond the seventh decade of life. Assessing patients for bone mineral density can identify patients at risk for developing osteoporosis. Simple balance tests, such as timing how long a patient can stand on one leg, can be part of an annual checkup and provide insight into fall risk. It's also an opportunity to target at-risk populations. Recognizing that black Americans and Americans from a lower socioeconomic standing are at a greater risk for developing frailty syndrome stresses the importance of preventative medicine for primary physicians working with these populations and may help to improve long-term outcome for these patients. One of the easiest intervention strategies is to promote exercise in elderly populations, which serves to maintain strength, balance, and bone mineral density. Currently, however, only a small proportion of seniors engage in structured exercise programs. Old age is often regarded as a time to slow down and rest, and many people regard exercise as a young person's activity. Patient education can help to reverse the stereotype and encourage physical activity. Simple lifestyle changes, such as taking morning and evening walks, can increase activity in individuals who are wary of the word exercise. To slow age-related losses in bone mineral density, education about the importance of dietary vitamin D supplementation should be made a routine conversation with older patients. I actually know of a geriatrician who preaches about vitamin D supplementation for everyone, regardless of age or risk assessment, as an important aspect of bone health. For patients at greater risk of osteoporosis, bisphosphonate medications help to prevent bone mineral density loss by promoting osteoclastic apoptosis.
The medication is well tolerated with few side effects. Despite this, patient compliance is poor due to the complex instructions associated with this medication. More recently, the development of annual intravenous treatments has helped to improve compliance. Now, bisphosphonate supplementation can lead to an increased rate of atypical fracture patterns to the shaft of the femur. These are commonly referred to as bisphosphonate fractures. But this is overshadowed by the substantial decrease in the rate of hip fractures in patients taking these medications. Another type of medication that improves bone mineral density is donosumab, an antibody that blocks the rank ligand on osteoblastic cells. Normally, this ligand will interact with the rank receptor found on osteoclasts to promote their survival and proliferation. Denosumab blocks this interaction, which once again promotes osteoclast apoptosis and decreases bone resorption. In addition to strategies to prevent the onset of frailty, additional strategies serve to prevent falls and fractures in a frail population. Some simple additions to a routine physical exam can identify issues that could lead to increased risk for falls that might be treatable. So, for example, through medical prescriptions. Speaking of prescriptions, a careful assessment of a patient's prescriptions could identify adverse side effects and drug-drug interactions that may lead to loss of balance and falls. Alternative approaches may be identified to minimize these adverse effects. Finally, the physician should reach out to other members of the healthcare team, such as occupational therapists, who can assess the patient's home and work environment for tripping hazards and make modifications to minimize the risk of falls. That will do it for our discussion of aging and the musculoskeletal system. Until next time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.